This is the Definitely Uncertain Podcast, brought to you by Gold Rock Capital. Each week, we look at how high net worth families can improve their lives, decisions, and investments in a deeply uncertain world. We always aim to provide practical information, even if we can't offer specific investment advice. This is the Definitely Uncertain Podcast, and my name is Jaron Rockman, and I'm a partner at Goldwell Capital, the 21-year-old multifamily office servicing high net worth families in Israel and around the world. One of the challenges that families have, all families, is talking to children about money. And amongst high net worth families, the problem and the issue is even more complicated. So to talk to us a little bit about some of the issues involved and the challenges and how one deals with them, I'm happy to welcome onto the podcast, Amy Castoro. Hi, Amy. Hi, Darren. It's lovely to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm glad glad that you joined. Amy comes to us from Princeton, New Jersey, and she, for the last 20 plus years, has been helping uh, families prepare succession, wealth transition, and to talking to their children about money. She's president and CEO of the Williams Group, and she has helped 800 high net worth families in their transition and next generation planning. Uh, you're an author. Amy's an author and a speaker, and a senior family coach, and we're really, really pleased that you've joined. So thanks, Amy. Thanks for coming on. No, it is my pleasure. Totally. Thank you. I should add that I am president and CEO of the Williams Group, which has been around for over 50 years. So we've been in this space for quite a long time. Wow. Indeed. Indeed. Okay. So you you wrote a, uh, an article in the, in the Financial Post a little while ago when you were, you were quite, oh, actually, I don't know if I'm going to start that question again. Um, in an article in the Financial Post that came out uh, not so long ago, you were quoted as saying that families are unwilling to have essential conversations about wealth transition because they don't trust themselves to have the conversation go well. What, what, what did you mean by that? Why is it that families don't trust themselves to have these conversations? If they did trust themselves, then we wouldn't be in business. The reason families often don't trust themselves is because they're avoiding the conversations that they're afraid if they have them is going to upset the apple cart in some way. Fundamentally, they're lacking or don't trust that they have the skills to keep those conversations productive and to make sure that on the other end of those conversations, everybody's still speaking to each other. It's the number one reason we find that families don't want to talk about the wealth. They're afraid if they talk about it, that the next generation will not want to get out of bed in the morning. They won't want to go to work. And so fundamentally, that's a conversation about trust, trusting the next generation and trusting themselves to have that conversation produce what they want it to produce. So so if we stay out under the covers in bed, then <laughs> you know, the world will just pass us by, right? Right. Or mom and dad will leave me enough money where I don't even have to get out of bed. Right. <laughs> you know, I've met so many of these next generation kids and and really that's the furthest thing from their mind. They're they are intimidated in some cases. They think it's overwhelming that they'll ever be able to make as much wealth as their parents or even that they'll have to be responsible for it in some way. But truthfully, they are looking to be a contribution in whatever way they can. They are, you know, the, the founder of our business has two sayings. One was the most important day of your life is the day you're born. The second most important day of your life is the day you find out why. And so we're all searching for what's meaningful. And these kids are searching too. It just might not be what mom and dad do for a living. Right, right. Do you find that some families never get to that conversation, that, that they push it off beyond the point at which it can ever be done? I would suggest that happens more often than not. The research would put that number somewhere between 70 and 80% wow. of the population. RBC did a study not too long ago, uh, 2017. They said roughly um, 75% of ultra high net worth clients would benefit from the principles, but only about 10% are talking about it. Wow. So yeah, there's a, there's a saying in almost every culture in the US, it's called shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. In Japan, it's teacup to teacup. In Italy, it's 
from the stalls to the stars to the stalls again. And unfortunately, all of them speak to the same issue that roughly our research included says about 70% of the families will not transition their wealth successfully. Successfully meaning the family relationships remain intact and they maintain control of their assets. Okay. So I suppose the primary mistake people are making or people make is not talking about it at all. Yeah. What are the some of the other mistakes that you see families make? The biggest one I see is that they assume the next generation wants to be either in the family business or play some uh, role in the foundation. We worked with a family recently where mom had two children. They were in their 40s and she created a family foundation. One of the two, the daughter, was deeply committed to nonprofit causes, the LGBT community. Her brother, on the other hand, made his living as a fisherman. He was a deeply religious right individual, very much salt of the earth was going to earn his way. His sister, on the other hand, was like, you know what, if you've got extra cash, I'll take it. And um, mom thought that the best way to help these kids get along better together or even to work together in support of her legacy was to have this family foundation. In the end, they did end up working well together, but initially neither one of those individuals wanted to be part of the family foundation. They just thought that they couldn't make a decision together because they were so incredibly different. But through the process of working with us and really getting a deeper understanding of each other, not about the assets and about each other, they realize that they're both deeply committed to reducing human suffering. They just have a different way of going about it. So right. today, the daughter actually asked her brother to be the godfather of one of her children. Wow. That wouldn't have been possible before they started. Fantastic. It sounds like th this is a control matter. The, the, the first generation or the, the, the old, older generation, let's call it, is concerned that the more they open up, the more they may lose control over the finances and over the destiny of the family? No question. You know, the same skills that create great wealth are not necessarily the same skills that give it away. So giving up that control is fundamentally a conversation about trust. How we work with families every day where the matriarch or the patriarch builds a great business and the next generation is clamoring for more control of how they run their individual divisions. You know, we're always saying, give them their heads so that they can make mistakes and learn. Um, there's no question that control is the biggest aspect here. And, and that really does come down to trust. How do they start having conversations about what competence means? How do they allow the next generation to fail and fail quickly? How do they tell the stories of when they failed and then still came out on top? So looking at it as a learning Opportunity as opposed to a, a competition can be very productive. Okay, so, so maybe give us three pointers to help people think about how to have healthier conversations about money and, and, and you know, with this idea that trust sits at the foundation layer of, of, of all these dynamics. The first pointer I would give is learn how to listen. There's an anonymous saying that truly being listened to is the closest thing to being loved. So if you want these conversations to go well, ask more questions. That would be the second point. And when I say ask questions, I don't mean ask questions that you already know the answer to. I'm, we call that reloading while listening, right? You ask a question and you're already thinking about the answer in the next question. We say ask questions that invite new possibilities rather than saying, I think you should do this, ask the question that says, what would it look like for you to be successful in that role? So inventing or inviting a future perspective, we call them vision questions, that would be number two. And number three would be talk to your kids about the wealth. For us, the founder of our business and, and don't wait to have that conversation. Start having that conversation now. There is a fourth actually, but on the third one, it's a, the founder of our business came out of the NFL. 
And we often use a football analogy for the family members to understand a little bit about the landscape of what they're up against. The accountants, the family office, the uh, advisors, the attorneys, they all know each other's role. They know what's going to happen when the estate ultimately transfers. They've got a really clear understanding of the playbook, the timing and the when and the who. The heirs, however, are the ones that ultimately have to catch the pass of the estate. And they're often in the dark. They don't know where the playbook even is. They don't know who's doing what role. So we say start having those conversations sooner than later. And, you know, the third, the fourth one that I would offer that I see consistently makes a difference is inviting the next generation to pick up a summer job as young as they can. It's not about the money as it is about them starting to experience the world about them testing themselves in different kinds of environments. So whether it's a camp counselor or maybe working in the foundation in some way, but encourage them to get a a summer job where they're starting to build some some wealth of their own, some some wealth in terms of education, wealth in terms of money. Right. Do you tend to find that this lack of trust that you mentioned before Mm -hmm. Uh, particularly when you're talking about sort of first generation uh, wealth creators passing money down to second generation is because they view the second generation as not having the resilience that they had to develop through the, through the struggles in the early years. It's interesting. You say that one of our best clients said to me, I can give my kids everything, but I can't give them desperation. (laughs) <laughs> that's a good one. That's really true. Cool. That's a good one. Um, but the question is really, how do they want to be a contribution? What right. do they see is meaningful? Just recently, we had dinner with that client, and I said, what are you most proud of? And he said, I'm most proud that my kids each see a way that they can be a contribution in their own lives, to their own families, and to this legacy that we've built. And I thought, that's pretty inspiring. Well, I, I actually know somebody who in their first job uh, didn't do very well, had got a great job. Um, and uh, halfway through the first year, um, the one, one of the, the secretary people, you know, in the days of the people used to have secretaries, one of the secretaries and the secretary people said to them, you know what your problem is? Your problem is that you're not hungry. Uh-huh. And, yeah. uh, and that person ended up generating uh, great hunger. So um, yeah, it, that, that's, that, that, w- that was a sort of focusing moment. So listening, ask more questions, talk to your kids early. Yes. How, how early? And, and that's, that's an issue that all families have to deal with. You know, we suggest that those conversations are happening already. You just not, might not be aware of it. We worked with a family where the daughter, maybe she was around 10, got on a commercial flight and she said to her father, what are all these people doing on our airplane? (laughs) There's a moment there where you go, hmm, Mm. right? (laughs) And there was another uh, old China Earth client we worked with. He went on vacation with some friends. His daughter walked into a gift shop. She wanted something that was not very expensive. Maybe it was $20. And he said to his daughter, well, let's let's see, maybe by the end of the week, if you've earned your allowance and everybody around him, their jaw just dropped to the floor. And they said, are you kidding me? And he said, absolutely not. This is about her learning that there's a cost and that there's a way to earn things that come her way. Mm. We're working with a family now where they unfortunately recently separated. They went through a divorce significant amounts of wealth, over a couple billion, the mom is concerned that her kids will grow up just blindly entitled. They are six, nine, and 12. Um, Right now, we had a meeting with them where we said to the six-year-old, you know, when you're watching TV or you're talking to your friends, what are you thinking about? What, What are the pieces that really tug at your heartstrings? She said, sea turtles. I saw this thing where the sea turtles are eating garbage and getting caught up in plastic. And so now they're looking at funding sea turtle rehabilitation centers. So there's a way to involve the next generation. Very early on, we worked with another family where the family went to Africa. One of the kids in grammar school learned that there were elephants that needed care over there. She came home, started a bake sale 
that bake sale went on for 15 years right. and they just kept sending money over to Africa. So they are watching. We tell all of our clients, your kids are watching everything you do. And so the more you can have a conversation and set some, some standard practices that become values, the better you're going to instill those values in there in your kids. So that's really interesting because if I sort of unpack that, what you're saying is that the conversation about the family finances is not a conversation. It's actually a long process over many years of right. preparing and slowly pulling back layer after layer, both in terms of values and I suppose also in terms of numbers. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the, the big question we get is how much do we give them and when? And we say that's the wrong conversation. Right. Or you might say that's the accent on the wrong syllable. <laughs> because <laughs> if, your, if your focus is on the assets, you've already lost them. Right. Who are they becoming? What's meaningful for them? Yeah. Where do they find they can make a difference in the world? What's the one big problem in the world they'd like to solve? So what is integrity? What's their dignity about? What happens if, if they tell a lie? So who, how are we creating the, the types of individuals that are fulfilling the values that we say what it means to be a rockman, for example? That's really where the wealth is. Right. And, 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 you know, it's interesting you say that because you're in our conversations with families, very often we're saying exactly what you're saying, which is you've got to think about what, what first you have to define the values for yourself, right? What, uh -huh. what, what is it that drives me? You know, is it hard work? Is it charity? Is it honesty? Is it, you know, absolute outperformance? Is it excellence? What, what are the things? And then, then you can start to have that conversation about what it is I want to translate to my children and then start to build yeah. some language around that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the kids are all hungry to hear the story of how the wealth was created, yeah. but not in terms of just the success stories. They want to hear about the struggles. They want to hear about the parents' parents and what shaped you as a as a parent. So those are, those are the pieces that are right. really do, do you find, though, that um, the struggles that the, the first generation, particularly in a first-generation situation, the struggles that the first generation describe don't really help the second generation because it's nothing that they will ever be able to experience themselves. You know, that, that idea that I sort of went door knocking, you know, house to house, you know, with my bag and, you know, my, 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 my clipboard and I was, you know, signing people up, you know, none of the kids are ever going to do anything like that. So how does that then help to frame a, a set of you know, values and, and, and a future for the next generation? What you're focusing on there is what they were doing not as much on who they were being. And you mentioned it earlier. There's this place right. around resilience. There's this aspect of grit. There's this, this level of determination that's important. Right. And that is central to what we, who we are as individuals. We want to have, we want to belong. We want to have an impact in the world. And so the level of effort that they make to go after something like that is what counts. How right. hard are they trying? And typically when we find that they're not trying, it's because they're misunderstood. We worked with a family where we finally got everyone together. We had an actual family meeting. It was a very successful family uh, in the States. And first day of the meeting, the youngest son doesn't show up. He's about 23. And the dad, you could see smoke coming out of his ears for what it took to pull this family meeting together. Right. And so finally they locate this little guy and he's out there on the golf course. So um, we have a conversation with him. He agrees to come in early and we start talking about trust. We say, hey, you know what? When we talk about trust, we talk about trust in these three, three legs. We have sincerity. Do you mean what you say? So when you said you would be here, did you mean what you said? The second thing we talk about is competence. Are you able to uh, be in the meeting and be productive? Yeah, you probably could. The third one we talk about is reliability. When we say reliability, we mean, can you manage all of your other commitments to show up on time? We think you probably could. So the breakdown in trust here was sincerity for him. And so we had a long conversation about that. And then finally, he said, you know, every time I open my mouth in these family meetings, nobody believes me. Nobody thinks I'm going to be able to do what I would say I want to do. 
So we said, okay, great. That's the conversation to have with the family. Right. Let's let them hear that. So he stood up and he said, you know, I know I'm the youngest, but every time I say something, you guys shoot it down. So finally the conversation got around to what is it that you want to do? And he said, real estate, I want to start doing deals. Family didn't have a big experience around real estate. Right. except the, the sister's husband was in contracting. He, he built uh, office buildings. Mm -hmm. So the kid said, what I'd like to do is shadow you for a year and see where that goes. And today he's doing deals with his dad. Fantastic. So very different time, but misunderstood. And so that's why his relationship was starting to drift. Okay. Let's take those three. Okay. So sincerity and reliability. Those mm -hmm. are things which, you know, given the right coaching and the right frame of mind and an absence of external stimuli, if we want to call it that, you know, people can maybe get their hands around, but, but competence that, that's a hard one, right? Because not all children are built equally. No, no, they're not. And that whole conversation around equal versus fair is, is probably at the center of that. However, the one of the big reasons moms and dads don't want to talk about the wealth is because they don't trust their next generation's competence to manage the wealth. They're afraid yeah. the wealth is going to manage them. And so when we talk about competence inside of families, we say, well, what does it look like for you to be prepared? What are your standards? And the kids never say a financial boot camp. <laughs> right. That's not what they say. <laughs> it's on the agenda. Yeah. Exactly. What they say is, I want to learn what is my portfolio? Who are right. the people involved right. with managing that? What is this whole thing? What's the connection between macroeconomics, like how the world behaves, and this thing called inflation? Right. But on their terms, right? We had a family meeting with a, a family. They brought in their family office person, a big family office you'd recognize. And we said to the kids, good news. They're coming to the meeting and we're going to have a great conversation. Every one of the kids rolled their eyes and said, you know what? Funny thing, we can't make it. And we said, what's going on? <laughs> right. These people hold key to your future. What's going on? And they said, well, every time we go, we feel like they walk through this big portfolio. Yeah, over straight over the top of my head. Yeah. No difference. Dad's in control. We don't need to know any of this. We've got lives to leave. Right. So we said, okay, great. The person shows up. We say, take that binder and put it back in the car. By the end of the meeting, what they had was a basic understanding of a 401k. Right. They had a basic understanding of diversification right. and why that might be important. And then they asked this question, what is this thing called impact investing? Mm -hmm. And the dad's like, I'm not sure. And so now we got something there. <laughs> Good. And, all right. Because their dad's yeah, not right. sure. Right. That just, <laughs> exactly. You know, I, I, I find that all the time. It's th There is almost this assumption that if you're wealthy, you understand about money and you understand yeah. investments. And because of that assumption, so many wealthy people are afraid to ask the types of very simple questions that would make their lives so much better. Yeah. And so that fundamentally is how do I be a learner yeah. in these ultra, ultra high net worth families where competition is key. It's not OK to look like you don't know. Right. And so yes. in our work, that comes right back down into competence. And yeah. how can we be how can it be OK in this family to be a learner? How can it be OK in this family to be something different? Than what everybody else is. Uh, we worked with a family recently where they were all attorneys. Everybody came out of the family and you had to be an attorney. The youngest one did it, went to school, became an attorney and hated every moment of it. So finally, one day he says to his dad, I want to be an art dealer. And the dad said, what? I want to be an art dealer. <laughs> so here they are today. And that art dealer, his uh, net worth is higher than everybody else's. Well, so, the art dealers don't have to bill by the hour. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Look, uh, for, for one one sort of you know last question, and, and this has been really eye-opening and you know the depth of your knowledge is just is just fantastic. If, if there was one hint that you would give people listening to this podcast, and, and maybe not only high net worth, anybody listening to this podcast, as to how to have that conversation about money better with your kids, what would it be? I would phrase it like this. I would say, you know what, kids. We're thinking about our estate plan, and we'd love to hear your perspective on how you'd like the wealth to impact your lives. Right. 
And then I would be quiet. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say a word except ask more questions. And when they ask you a question that you're not ready to answer, so you know, that's something I'm still working on. Not sure I'm ready to answer that question yet. Right, right. Very but good. let's talk about it again in about a year. Very good. Well, in that case, I'm going to have to do a shout out to my late grandmother, Booga Bertha, who was by far the best listener and the best ask, asker of open <laughs> questions I've ever met in my entire life. There you go. And you felt loved. Every yeah, time. I certainly do. Every I certainly do. <laughs> Amy Castaro from the Williams Group, thank you very much for being on Definitely Uncertain. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure entirely, Darren. Thank you for the opportunity. It's great. And uh, for all of you listening out there, tune into new episodes as they're coming out on a weekly basis. And uh, we look forward to your feedback. So if anybody has ideas for uh, topics you'd like us to cover, uh, please send us an email to podcast at goldrockcap.com. Thanks very much. Bye, Andy. Bye, everybody. Bye. Sorry, <laughs> bye, bye, Amy. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>